Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Pastor Mike read that uh, previously in the service, and so I'll just direct your attention uh, back to there. Uh, let me ask you a question here right off the bat, as we, it'll go along with our message here this morning in chapter 12 and verse number 1. How many of you like to race? How many of you like to race? Would you raise your hand? You like to be involved in some type of race? Well, that's very few people. How many of you in here are human today? How many humans? All right. Wow, still a low number of humans. So uh, how many of you are hungry? All right, well, there's snacks on the other side of the building. You can leave a tip for the teenagers, and uh, we appreciate um, you being here present. So all the rest of you that just didn't want to participate, uh, well, the title of, uh, or the section that we're studying here, uh, verse number 12, has to deal with this idea of being compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, and let us lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us. And, and so if you've heard this taught on before, a lot of times we liken it to a race, uh, and so we'll be uh, looking at it from that standpoint here this morning. Uh, I will give you some review and background here so to catch you up because uh, I've preached in this portion of Scripture before. I've heard many other people preach in this portion of Scripture. And, and sometimes we, I don't think we do it justice or service by really understanding what's behind all this instead of just preaching this, as we say sometimes, out of context, just quoting the verses and kind of preaching a topical message. So uh, I think the background to this and the, the word meaning in this will help us greatly to understand what is really put forth here. Uh, but with the question, how many of you like to race? Uh, let me ask this. How many of you ever participated in some sort of race? Okay, there's a lot more people. So you don't like it, but you've done it. I get it. Well, I like racing. I like competition in general. Uh, I, I like to participate in different types of things, and uh, I've enjoyed that even watching our, our boys grow up and being in different uh, athletic competitions. I still like to uh, compete with them, although it's getting harder and harder uh, to keep up with them. Uh, but our text today speaks of such a race, uh, but it's a quite different race than the typical race that we would think about. Uh, interesting. Uh, enough that our vacation Bible school actually this year is called the Incredible Race, and it's talking about different types of racing, but uh, we're going from continent to continent with the kids, learning about uh, some of the things about the continent, but then learning about the Tower of Babel and, and decisions that need to be made in life, uh, and so uh, that'll be a fun theme for us uh, for our vacation Bible school as well. Uh, but what I've noticed about this particular race uh, it's speaking of a Christian race of sorts. Uh, the map is similar, but it's different for every individual. Now think about that for a moment. The map is similar to this race that our text speaks of, but it's different for every single one of us. And you say, what kind of race is that? Well, it's the Christian race. And even though that uh, you're in a race, we're not competing against one another. And this is the key that we need to understand about this race. We're not competing. I'm not trying to beat you. You're not trying to beat me. Uh, we are trying to finish well. And that's the beauty of this particular race. We are attempting to finish our Christian race well here on this earth to glorify God, not ourselves. This race isn't for us to get a prize, although we will be rewarded substantially. It is for us to bring God glory, give Him the honor, and give Him the, the glory that's due to His name. And so if we understand the concepts being taught here, I think it will help you so much more fully understand even this portion of Scripture. And I hope that will be a help and encouragement to you in your Christian life. But the length of the race is different for each one of us as well. There are two main requirements that don't change in this particular race, and that is faithfulness and endurance. Faithfulness and endurance. Our text here today is a continuation of chapter number 11. It really, uh, those who put in the chapter delineations uh, here, it would just flow from chapter 11, verse number 40. It would just flow right into this. Uh, but yet, uh, those who put in the chapter uh, delineations and, and numbers um, weren't thinking of it in exactly that way. So uh, if you were read verse number 40, as we did last week, we would just continue to read down through here uh, to bring it all uh, into understanding for us together. Uh, but those who have gone before us are mentioned here in uh, uh, verse number uh, 1 and 2 here, but it's in reference to those in, in chapter 11 that we studied on last couple weeks. 
And as those who have gone before us make up that cloud of witnesses, and I would say, and others who now as Christians have run their race well here in this earth, they have now joined that great cloud of witnesses up in heaven who have been saved by faith uh, alone and uh, have trusted Christ, lived their life on this earth. They are now part of that cloud of witnesses up in heaven. And so we recognize that it's speaking here, uh, this terminology talking about a race. What does this race require to finish well for us? How do we finish this race well? If you would permit me, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 5, it states this, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. And let me explain it to you. If, you're, if you go over to our gymnasium and you look back up on the wall, uh, from this verse, I came up with that phrase that we put in there on the, on the gymnasium wall, wall, and it says, play hard, play fair, play to win. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I love competition. I love being in, involved with competition. But I also believe there's a biblical principle that we extracted from this verse. If a man strive for masteries, masteries there is in reference to games, types of competition. If we strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned or rewarded, Except he strive, how so? Lawfully. He obeys the rules. He plays fairly. And so we have the play hard, the play fair, the play to win over there in the gymnasium for our recreation area. And I believe that also applies to our life. The context in 2 Timothy, written by the Apostle Paul, is talking about being a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He uses many different common uh, term, terms and terminology and, and illustrations to drive home the message of being faithful and being committed and doing well to honor our God. And so if we were to go back and look at chapters 1 through 10 of the book of Hebrews and up to verse number 18, what we saw in those studies was that it reveals Jesus as the superior uh, and, uh, and he is uh, superior as um, the priest, the great high priest, it speaks of uh, the fact of his superiority compared to the religious rites and rituals that many of the Jews in that day were trying to live by in order to prove themselves to God. And this is sometimes the, the trouble that we have when we talk about religion and a faith uh, relationship with God. Some people think, well, because I go to church and because I've participate in all the things the church tells me to do, baptism and Lord's Supper, communion. Uh, some churches, they have more sacraments that they have involved. And, and, uh, and so people feel like, well, if I do all those things that the church tells me that I'm supposed to do, then of course God will accept me because I did everything that the church required. The problem with that is that's not what our Bible says about being accepted by God. Now, does that cast out those things? Should we not go to church? Should we not uh, participate in the ordinances? No, we should absolutely participate in those things. But that is not what justifies you. That is not what, what makes you a saved person. The, the idea of this uh, terminology being saved or salvation simply means to be delivered. You're delivered from your sin debt spiritually. How so? Do you believe Jesus Christ is God? That he died on that cross in your place as your substitution. That he was buried in the tomb but rose again from the dead. He proved without a shadow of doubt that he was God. And by doing that, he now is able to deliver you, save you from your sin debt. And give you eternal life from the moment you understand it and ask him for that salvation until he takes you home to be with him. You are so secure in that if you understood it and you believe it and you asked him for it, you're as good as already in heaven with him. So then now we go to church faithfully, that we read our Bible, that we pray, that we do good works. That has nothing to do with your salvation. That's because you're a saved person. You do that to honor God. There's the difference. There are some people doing all those things to say, okay, God, you've got to accept me now to heaven. Were the others, us, who believe in salvation by grace through faith, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, but it's a, it is a gift God gave us. And now because he's gifted me with this wonderful, precious, eternal gift of salvation, I get to serve him. I get to honor him with my life. I get to live for him and to now uh, come to church and participate in the ordinances and participate in serving our community and participate in the different church functions. Not because I, I'm doing it so that he... You know, I'm, I'm questioning whether or not he'll take me to heaven. No, 
That's a done deal. I'm doing it because I'm showing him that I love him. I'm showing him that I want to honor him with my life now that I am one of his. And so there's two sides to that. Those who are doing it to work their way to heaven and those who already know they're going to heaven and they're doing it because they want to honor their God. That's the takeaway from this understanding of salvation by grace through faith alone. You're not working to get to heaven. Something God gifted you with if you believed it and trusted him as your savior. And so that is something that some people are still trying to work through. They're still thinking, that's too easy, pastor. That's, that, that doesn't make You're going to have to argue with the Bible because that's what the Bible says. It never says in there that we're to work or to do all these different things to be saved. That's something man came up with, and it seems to make sense because, well, wouldn't God expect us to do it? No. He expects you to trust him, believe in what he accomplished, and then you know how you live for him as one of his followers. So chapter 1 through chapter 10, verse number 18, explains to us that Jesus is superior to all the rites and rituals of the religious system. But then it also moves us forward to understand that Jesus, as the great high priest, has the ability to absolutely cleanse you of your sins, forgive you of your sins. He was not like an earthly priest who is limited. If you remember our studies, it tells us in our studies that the, the, the uh, uh, priests on the earth were limited because, one, they died. They weren't eternal. Two, they were sinners themselves. It says that. If you remember the studies, it tells you they were sinners too. They had to make an offering for themselves. The difference between the earthly priests and Jesus, who, yes, was God's special priest, if you would, he did not have to offer for himself. He was already perfect. He never sinned. And so for him to then be sacrificed on our behalf paid our debt in full. Where the Old Testament system, they had to do it again and again and again and again and again. And Jesus coming said, that system is done. Now the eternal priest has made the sacrifice necessary for every person. And so that is something that you need to keep in your mind as you study the book of Hebrews and understand the, the terminology about salvation. The writer of Hebrews is trying to explain to those believers in this day who are questioning things, hey, the sacrificial system was for a time. It pointed forward to a time that Jesus would come. He would be the final sacrifice needed because of who he is, a superior high priest. He is the one we look to. And so he's trying to remind them of that. Then in chapter 10, verse number 19, it begins the practical outworking of your faith. What do you do now that you understand that your faith has made you whole in God's eyes, that your faith has delivered you from your sin debt. You're not working to be saved. He says, now what do you do? And in chapter number 10, verse number 19, all the way up to where we're at now, it's a continuation of the thought. Here's what you do in order to honor God with your life. Here's what you need to understand about this relationship with God. Practically, here's how you work that out in your life. Not to be saved, to demonstrate you're already a true believer in Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, I want to just give you uh, some information about this particular text then. Notice again in verse number one, I want to talk, talk to you first of all. Well, let me give you the title. I've entitled this message, Endurance Required. Endurance Required. And this is not for salvation. This is for you to live faithfully as a Christian to go home to your reward in heaven as one of God's followers, not having shamed him in your walk with him. Endurance required. Number one, I want you to notice the eternal audience. The eternal audience in verse number one. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of what? Witnesses. So here he's talking about these witnesses, those who are, uh, whether or not they can actually see us. I've, had, I've, I've read commentators and I've heard preaching where they're actually watching us from heaven, like grandstands in heaven, they're watching what we're doing. Uh, I can't tell you that for sure. I'm not sure that God is allowing them to watch us right now to observe what we're doing. Some commentators believe they are. Some commentators uh, believe that, that that's not accurate. We don't have enough information. But what this is saying is, those witnesses, those who have gone before us, who live faithfully for God until their death, that's the crowd that this is talking about. And so that crowd is being added to every single day. I'm not talking about everyone that died. I'm talking about only those who were, were true believers, only those who were faithful to God. That cloud of witnesses, those who already participated in this race, are the ones who are considered this cloud of witnesses, this great uh, a group of witnesses who have already run their race. 
So those who are mentioned in chapter number 11, if you go back to chapter 11 and verse number, uh, let's see, skip down here to verse number 4. Chapter 11, verse number 4, it mentions, by faith, Abel. And Abel went through uh, a, a personal test, but Abel was righteous. Verse number 5, by faith, Enoch. Verse number 7, by faith, Noah. Verse number 8, by faith, Abraham. Uh, verse number 11, by, uh, through faith, Sarah. And we go on and on. And remember, last week we took time to go through and we looked at the men and the women who uh, some had to sacrifice. Their lives were taken for them. They became martyrs. They would be included in this cloud of witnesses that by faith they said, nobody's going to change the fact that we believe that God is who he says he is. We believe in God's promises. They knew that and they were willing to go through very difficult times in their life trusting God all the way through. So their race was a little different than ours. We're not called at this day and age for us necessarily to be martyrs. Now if you go over to the Middle East... There are people dying today for their faith that are just like you and me, that live in a different place, live in a different style home, eat different type of food, but they love Jesus Christ just like you and I do, and yet their faith has taken them to their grave. Their race is a little different than ours, but they've been faithful to honor Jesus Christ their life. And he makes reference to that in chapter 11 about those who have gone on before us. Some did great Amazing feats. God worked miracles to them. And that was their race. Others died for their faith. They were martyrs. That was their race. And we have to come to the point of understanding, what does our race include? How long will God let me be in this race here on this earth? What does my race map look like? And so we see, first of all, the eternal audience. Those who have gone before us, who have stayed faithful to God all the way to the end, fulfilled whatever he had for them. The second thing I want you to notice, and there's four guidelines under this that I'll, I'll share with you, the expected actions. Notice uh, Roman, uh, Romans. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1, once again, about midway down. Let us lay aside every, what's the word? Weight and the what? Sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Let me explain. I have four guidelines here that I, I took from the text that I want you to understand. The first one is let us lay aside every weight. We have to understand something. If you've ever been involved with a, a race, um, you don't want to wear things that are going to encumber or hinder your speed or agility. Now, I remember several years ago up in Hartford, they had this... Um, obstacle course race that some of our boys were involved with and uh, people dressed up in all kinds of funky outfits. Some people wore flippers and everything. And it wasn't necessarily the speed of getting through it. You were getting wet. You were getting soapy water thrown at you and fire hoses sprayed at you. It was a fun obstacle course race that they went through. And uh, it was just really to go out there and have fun. But uh, you have to understand, when you get involved with a running race or any type of race, uh, you're not putting on a snowsuit. You're not putting on a coat of armor. Typically, you're trying to uh, get your outfit down to its minimal amount of weight. I remember back when I was in high school that uh, during the Olympics, um, I can't remember the athlete, but they came out with these sneakers, I think it was Nike that made them, and they said that the sneaker weighed about an ounce or less than an ounce, and I can't remember what the actual weight was, but they were so light that they said they're like feather light type shoes, and it was for these professional athletes, so that way their speed and their ability to run was so much uh, uh, faster because they didn't have all these weight restrictions. If you look at the Olympic swimmers and you realize that they developed these suits for these swimmers that uh, they would they wear the full body or half body suits and it caused them to cut through the water even quicker and they had to put some restrictions on that because other countries didn't have the same ability to, to buy those types of uniforms for them. But we realized everything was to streamline it to make it light as possible and, and easier to cut through the air. That was the ability, that, that was designed so that you would be more proficient, or if you would, that you would have less weight attached to you uh, in order for you to, to uh, be less hindered, less effective uh, in your running or in whatever type of uh, uh, race it was. And so we understand that the idea here of laying aside every weight is not necessarily just weights heaped upon you. I don't believe that this weight here is necessarily talking about sin. 
We need to think of this in a more broader understanding because he mentions sin next. And so in this case, it's more of a general idea of what weights would hinder you in this Christian race? And that might be different for you than it is for me. Since we have a different route map that God is providing for you than he is for me, your hindrances or things that would hinder you may not hinder me in this Christian race. Now, I would say that all of us have some general things that are going to hinder our Christian race. There are certain things that we just know you shouldn't do as a Christian. There are certain things spiritually that are not good for me. The same things are not good for you. But you may have a different type of occupation. You may have a different type of family background. You may have a different type of work environment. You may have a different type of family structure. You may have a different type of physical uh, maladies. You may have a different type of emotional and mental makeup. Other things happen in your life. Traumas come into our lives and situations come into our lives. Listen, this is all a part of your particular race map. This does not surprise God. And we must understand that your race map may be different than my race map, but you're still called to the same two principles, endurance and faithfulness. Just because you say, well, I'm, not, I'm going through something that nobody else in the whole world's going through. All right, one, that's not true. But two, God has still called you to be faithful to Him and endure those difficulties of this race that He's allowed to come in your life. And that's something that's hard for us. to. Str we struggle with that sometimes. So laying aside the weights, let me, I just jotted down a few that might uh, uh, be something you understand. What are some of the weights in our lives that spiritually would hinder our ability to run this Christian race well? How about holding on to hurts? Don't, don't acknowledge it in any way. But any of you ever held on to hurts? What does that mean? Even if you could get over something, you're not willing to get over something. The danger with that sometimes is sometimes we enjoy the anger. Now, none of you would be like that. Nobody in here would, would have that where they would just enjoy being mad at somebody. But that's a danger. And we're violating script, scriptural principle about letting go of something and making things right and offering forgiveness. Holding on to hurts, lack of forgiveness. How about a critical spirit, slander, gossip? These are weights that hinder our Christian race. Listen, there are some of these things that are similar to all of us. God has called you and He's called me to run this race well. And He wants us to endure trials. He wants us to endure conflicts. He wants us to be faithful to Him in all areas of Christian virtue and principle. But there are things that come into our life that... Obstacles... How many ever ran an obstacle course race? You ever ran a, several years ago? I uh, took a couple of my sons and we ran in the Spartan race. I love that kind of stuff. That's really cool. They have all these different things. Be honest with you, I don't like running. Just being honest with you, I don't like running unless I'm playing a sport or doing something. I, 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 I purposely will make myself run several miles just to do it as a mental gymnastics because I'm hate running to run. I just do. I don't like running to run. I do it because it's good for my health and I, and I want to try to maintain uh, some type of health uh, while I'm younger and uh, as long as I can. But I, I really don't like it. I'd rather be playing a sport of some kind. I'd rather be doing an obstacle course, something like that. But the obstacles that, that they set up in these courses uh, are there to stop you from running. Now you have to do some type of physical activity before you can take off running again. And I like the physical activity. I don't like the running. And so the whole time I'm running, I said, I can't wait to get to the next obstacle. I'd rather do the obstacle five times than run to the next obstacle. That's just the way my, I'm geared. But, so you go through all these different obstacles in order to get to the finish line. And the obstacles are there to prevent you or to limit you from just running an easy race. Do you realize that God has given you some purposeful obstacles in your life as a Christian? In some cases, God is the one who's put the obstacles in. Now, listen to me clearly here. God sometimes is the one who puts the obstacles in your way. Now, listen to the other side of this. Sometimes we put obstacles that God never intended on our own map. And I know that God is all-knowing, but I could see him 
looking at your map and say, hmm, I didn't put that on his map. I didn't put that on her map. That's a self-induced obstacle. But you know what we do as faithful Christians? God, why would you put me through this? And God's up in heaven. John, I didn't do that. That's on you. But sometimes we bring things into our lives that God never intended. Now can God work in that and through that? Yep, he's a big God. But now you're sidetracked a little while. You're detoured a little while. And it may not, when I say a little while, some things have prevented people from going any further for quite a long time in their race. That race from going this way has now just stopped dead in its tracks and it's just kind of running in circles over here. And people are lapping you saying, how long are you going to keep doing that? And sometimes we can say, man, God must really have it out for you. And God's saying, it's not me. They just haven't looked back up. They're just living in this little, their own self-made obstacle here, and they're not learning the lesson. And we must understand that sometimes it's not God that put that obstacle there. You, your decisions. Well, I prayed about it. Okay. I've had many people tell me, well, pastor, I prayed about it. All right, but here's biblical principle you violated. Here's clear biblical principle. God would not have let you make that decision. And now not only you, but your kids, your wife, your husband, your extended family, many times your church family, we're all there saying, okay, how do we help out? But it might not have ever been an obstacle that God intended for you. So don't blame everything on God. We must understand that God does put obstacles, but then sometimes we put our own obstacles in our way. And sometimes obstacles come from the people that we're in relationships with. And God never tended for their obstacles to be your obstacles. Is anybody thoroughly confused yet? I'm just trying to drive on this point is, listen, all of our maps are a little different. But sometimes the maps overlap. When I got married to my wife, we, we vowed a vow to be to, with each other for life. Some of her obstacles became my obstacles. Some of my obstacles became her obstacles. That was a commitment we made to each other. So we're going to get through these things together. When God blessed us with our five sons, every son we had became part of our life. Their obstacles, in some cases, became our obstacles. In some cases, I said, son, I love you. This is your obstacle. I'll be here, but I'm not just going to bail you out. Now listen, that's exactly what God does sometimes for us. Does he have the power to bail you out of everything? Yep. But he also knows as a wise father, it's not wise for him to bail you out of everything. You put this obstacle on your course? Okay, go ahead. Now he'll still be there, but he's not going to just bail you out of every decision that you make. You must be willing to get back to where God wants you in order for him to keep helping you. Laying aside every weight. I could go through a whole list of things. Unwillingness to serve God by serving others. Excuses for not being faithful. Fleshly entertainment instead of spiritual exercise. Willingness to follow when it's inconvenient. And he lists all these different characters in chapter number 11 that were faithful through very difficult times or God called them to a task that was so far above them they had no idea how it was going to get done but they trusted God and they were faithful and they endured all the way to the end by their faith in God. Let us lay aside every weight. Secondly, I want you to notice the wording here. In verse number 12, and the sin which thus so easily beset us. Now, as a good Bible student, one of the things that we learn about studying the Bible is what's the context? You have the text which I just read and the sin which doth so easily present us. And then the greater context. What is this in reference to? Is this just a one-line statement that we're talking about? We just make up whatever sin it's talking about? Or is a specific reference? And so we know about studying portions of Scripture or, or larger portions of Scripture. What is the book of Hebrews about? And this is very important for us. Because he's driving home a point with these examples of faith in chapter 11. He now moves in our Bibles. It goes to chapter 12 now. And he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. 
What sin, singular, would he be talking about? What sin would he be talking about here that easily besets us? In other words, that word of beset restricts us and keeps us from moving on for the Lord. Well, what we have to look at, what is the main sin reference to in this book? I want to just take you on a quick little study. Go back to Hebrews chapter 3 with me. Hebrews chapter number 3. Again, this is the greater context. We look at, look at, we follow the themes through the books that we're studying. Hebrews chapter 3, and look with me, if you would, at verse number 12. Verse number 12, this is the second warning of, of this book of the Bible that was given to us. Notice what it says here, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any root, or excuse me, in any of you, an evil heart of what? Unbelief, and departing from whom? The living God, all right? Skip over to verse number 18. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that did what? Believe not. Look at verse number 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. Skip down to chapter 4, verse number 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, nor uh, not being mixed with what? Faith. So we look now, and if we were to just keep going through the book of Hebrews, and we get finally to chapter 12, verse number 1, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. What is the sin in context of what he's talking about through here? He's talking about people who went back on their faith. They did not have the faith to continue to trust God until the end of their lives. And that's why he gives us in chapter 11 all these people who went through extreme circumstances, but they said, we believe God. We're not going to turn them back on him. And they trusted God all the way to the end. They demonstrated their faith. And what chapter number 12, verse number uh, one is speaking of here is, we are looking at the sin of unbelief. People who turn their back on God and stop following him. Or people who heard the truth, but now will not obey the truth, will not listen to the truth, will not be converted to the truth. And so here we have the idea that this sin that besets us would be the lack of faith or unbelief that is, that is being talked about here. So we have, let us lay aside every weight, and we can talk about multiple things about the weights that uh, uh, beset us. And then, of course, uh, laying aside the sin, the sin of unbelief or lack of faith. Notice what it says next. There's the, the third thing. Run with what? Patience. Run with patience. This patience is talking about endurance. Another good word for you to think here is determination. This is it's talking about an athlete who is running in a race, and they are determined that nothing is going to stop them. I've been in races and, and, and viewed races and watched races, and I've seen people, uh, you know, runners that have fallen down, scratched up their legs, scratched their knees, and they've not quit. They got back up, and they said, no matter what, they're going to finish the race. They've gotten so close to the finish line where they just collapse on the ground, and they've crawled the rest of the way with people coming up saying, let us help you. They say, no, don't touch me. I'm going to finish this race. I'm determined to finish this race. And that's what's being said here. As a Christian, sometimes you need to be so determined it doesn't matter if you're battered. It doesn't matter if you're bloody. It doesn't matter if you've been knocked down a hundred times. You can't quit on God. You just keep going forward because you know He is true and He's allowing you sometimes to go through some very difficult obstacles, but by faith you trust Him. I'm looking at a, a, a group of people here, but I know some of your stories. And you've been knocked down, some of you, again and again and again. And your testimony does not have to be declared, doesn't have to be put up on the screen. Just by people seeing you and knowing what you've been through, they're like, okay, that's a person of faith. That's a person of endurance. That's a person that really believes God is God. Because some of the things that some of you have been through would cause some weaker Christian to say, that's it, I'm done. I'm out. But not you. That's a tribute to your faith in your God. That's huge. It's a great testimony of who you are. It's a great testimony of who you really believe God is. So we're to run with patience, endurance. And then fourthly under this, run, I put these, these are my words, run your race. 
It says in the text, run the race before us. This is personal. God has a race map for you specifically. It's your race. You may be husband and wife, maybe a family, we may be a church family, but he's got an individual race for you and it kind of bleeds over into maybe your spouse and your kids and others. But it's your race. You need to own it, you need to accept it, and you need to say, okay, God, if you design this race for me, you know the obstacles that you're bringing in. Help me not to bring in my own. Why make this race any harder than it has to be? But sometimes we do. Lord, forgive me and help me to work through that. And it might be a detour for a while, but get back on his map. But then you can ask God to give you the ability to go through and keep plugging along, keep going through, and run the race that he has for you. And the beauty of this is you don't know what's coming next. You say, I hate those kind of races, Pastor. You need to learn to be a little more adventurous because living the Christian life is adventurous. And if you want to understand what faith is, faith is taking risks. It's trusting God. I'm not talking about silly carnal risks. I'm talking about trusting God and putting yourself out there and say, okay, God, what do you have for us next? He may just surprise you. Because sometimes people say, if I take a risk and take a step of faith, it's going to be negative. Why think that way? He's a God that loves you. There are many risks that we've taken as a family. We're like, that was awesome. That was great. We watched God bless in ways that we never would have seen if we didn't take those steps of faith. Trust God. He's not out there to get you. He doesn't always have to use negatives to, to build you. He can use other things to build you. But some people are so terrified to trust God. Take a step of faith. Trust God. No, don't be foolish about it. Make sure you're prayed up. Make sure you have good principle. Get counseling if it's something really big. But trust God. Run your race. He's got a personal race for you. And then lastly, I want you to notice, verse number two, the exalted author of your race. The exalted author. Verse number two says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your what? Faith. There it is again. The author and finisher of your faith. It's personal to you. God loves you. He has a desire to help you run your race. We look unto Jesus. Why Jesus? Well, He is the author and finisher of our faith. That means He's the beginner and the completer of your faith. The word author is used in our Bible only about four times in this same uh, matter of understanding. It's used as prince. It's used as captain. It's used also here as author. Hebrews 2, verse number 10, he actually, Jesus is actually called the author of salvation. The author of salvation. And so not only is he the author of faith, but he's also the author of your salvation. When you come to him and say, Jesus, I believe that you're God, I believe that you did everything necessary to pay my sin debt, he also then begin, becomes the beginner of your faith and the beginner of your salvation, your deliverance. Jesus suffered, he was tempted, he was made like us. Why? Because he experienced what we as humans experienced so that, we could, so that he could sympathize with us and set an example for us. He wasn't a sinner. He was perfect, he was blameless. But he became human so that, he, that we would understand that He knows our pain. He understands what we're going through. He went through the same things. The Bible says He was tempted in all points, like as we are. The difference is, He never sinned. I can't say that. A lot of my temptations turned into sins. But not Him. He proved that He was God and able to overcome the temptations What's the expectations of us all? The expectation that he has for us is to stay in the race. Verse 2 again, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, 
Jesus did everything necessary. He saw the joy of knowing that millions and millions of people would come to faith in him, that he would have them for all eternity. He endured the pain of the cross. He despised, meaning he, he knew the shame associated with the cross, and he treated the shame associated with the cross as nothing compared to allowing you to come to know him as your personal savior so that he could have you with him in heaven for all eternity. And he sits now at the right hand of the throne of God, meaning he's in the high, exalted position as God, next to his Father. The expectation of us all is to stay in the race, to be faithful. The endurance mentioned in verse number one is not a sitting and waiting type of faith. It's a determination to keep going, to keep going, to keep going. Don't quit. Verse number one starts with, or, or it mentions in there, let us lay aside every weight. That term, let us, is mentioned a number of times in the book of Hebrews. Back in Hebrews chapter four, verse number one, let us fear. In other words, not trusting in God's promise. Let us fear not trusting God. Verse number 11, let us labor. Verse number 14, let us hold fast our profession of faith. Verse number 16, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Chapter 10, verses 19 through 25 says, let us draw near. Let us hold fast. Let us consider. This terminology being referenced here. All this points to the fact that Jesus is trustworthy and we can absolutely depend on him for our race. Whatever he's called you to do, you can absolutely depend on him. He is absolutely trustworthy for you to depend on him for the race map he's given to you. Notice in verse number three, for consider him that endured such contradiction. That word contradiction there has the idea of oppression, opposition. He endured the opposition of sinners against himself, yet, excuse me, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. In other words, consider that Jesus Christ faced all this opposition in order to save you so that you don't become weary in the fight. He wants you to know, hey, you're going to go through times of trials and persecutions perhaps, but like Jesus went through these things, he says, since I could do it, you can do it, and he's there to empower you to be able to go through the trials that come in your life, the obstacles that he knows will come in your life, he will help you through those things just as he went through those things. Then notice verse number four. Ye have not yet resisted unto what? Blood. Now this is kind of a gory depiction here, but you need to understand it. Ye have, yet, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against, what's the word? Sin. He's kind of making a, a personification here. And if you would picture for your mind, in your mind's eye, the, the, the Greek in, uh, um, games back uh, in the Bible times were something that they would fill the Colosseums and people would come in and watch gladiators and they would have uh, different types of competitions. They had a, a major marathon back then even. And people would come and they would watch these things take place as spectators. And sometimes in the different competitions... Somebody would get uh, stumble and fall and, and get beat up or they would get bloodied. And the idea that he's saying here is as you look down, you see your skin knees. You look down, you see your, 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 the blood on your hands from whatever activity you were involved with. What he's saying here now in verse number four, ye have not yet resisted unto blood like that. Many Christians today are so anemic spiritually. They're, we're so weak spiritually. We quit if we get the sniffles. We blame God if something doesn't go just our way in a day. We're, we're very anemic spiritually sometimes. And he was saying, listen, you've not resisted to the point of falling down, scraping your knees, blooding your palms, looking at them and saying, saying you know what? Medic, I'm out. Somebody else take my place. No. You look at that and you say, I'm going to keep going. I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. He said, listen, at least you could do is see the skin knees and realize it's not a life-threatening thing. It's not over for you. And even if you're in your hospital bed and they tell you we have very bad news, the worst news we could tell you, man, witness to every nurse that comes in that room. 
Witness to every doctor that you talk to, Henry and Lori. Witness to every person that comes to visit you and say, make sure they know they're going to heaven. At least go to heaven doing God's work while you can. We have people that just give up. Give up. God's expectations are enhanced by His provision and promises to you. God's expectations are enhanced. If you recognize His provisions and His promises He's made to you, they enhance God's expectations. You say, why? Because if God expects us to keep going even if we're battered and bloodied, He said, I'm not expecting anything less of you than I did myself. And He said, and I'll be there with you. I'll be there with you to go through this race with you. But we must trust Him. What's your race map? What has God given to you? In some instances, all Christians will have the same obstacles in this particular race. In some cases, God will use different obstacles for you personally that are unique to you. Sometimes we bring our own obstacles into this race by increasing the weights or not living by faith. So what's the application? Let us draw near to God. Let us hold fast to the faith. Let us consider one another. You know what the beauty of being around other Christians that also are going through obstacles as well? We can learn to encourage each other instead of discourage one another. You might find out by talking with another Christian and asking for prayer, hey, they've been through the exact same thing or something similar and here's what God did for me. That may not be the same for you, but you can find encouragement from another brother or sister in Christ. We can all help each other out and we can stay faithful together as we go through this race because I don't know where my finish line is, folks. I'm standing here today, as far as I know, a healthy man. And my finish line could be next week and I don't even know about it. Yours could be in five years, 10 years, 20 years. We don't know. Endure and be faithful. Trust God through the obstacles. He's a gracious and wonderful God. Father, we thank you for your words. We thank you for people who have gone on before us. Such as reference here in the scriptures. And of course, we know many, many wonderful Christians who have been through many obstacles that stayed faithful all the way until the time you took them home. May we have the same testimony. May we not wait for the next obstacle. May we get involved now. May we realize that part of your work in our lives is to be faithful to you as a Christian right now. May we find a place to serve you and honor you with our life. May we learn to encourage others by the things that we've learned as a Christian. So Lord, today, part of our worship, may we give ourselves to you. May we give you permission, not that you need it, to write the map for us. And by faith, we'll trust you all the way to the end. With our heads bowed, bowed and eyes closed, a couple questions for you. How many would say, Pastor, honestly, right now, I'm, I'm at an obstacle, and I need God to intervene on this one. Would you just pray for me? Would you just raise your hand and say, yes, I've got an obstacle in my life right now, and I need God. God bless you. God sees your hand, and I'll pray for you in just a moment. How many of you would say, Pastor, I'm, I just came, I'm on the other side of an obstacle. I'm just on the other side of an obstacle, but I saw God work in my life. And just with my hand lifted up, I just want to praise Him. I just want to say, thank you, Lord. Would you raise your hand? Oh, God bless you. Praise the Lord. Amen. God knows what's going on. And we have both. We have those that are in obstacles right now. We have those of us, we don't even know what our next obstacle is going to be. But then if you notice, we had those who have come through an obstacle and they could say, God brought us through it. Folks, we're all at some level of this race and that's going to happen multiple times in your Christian life. Get to the point where you just say, no matter what, I'm determined to follow God. I will be faithful to Him until the end. He will bless you for it in time. You must trust Him. Last question, I don't know if there's someone here today say, Pastor, I've heard what you said many times, or today's the first time, but 
I've never made Jesus Christ my Savior. I've heard about it. I thought I understood it, but you explained it earlier, and that makes sense. And I want to trust Jesus Christ right now as my Savior. That's my desire. I know it's the right thing to do, and I want to ask Him to be my Savior right now. So there's someone here today who say, Pastor, that's me. Would you pray for me? Would you lift your hand up as well? Just say, yes. Pray for me. I want to trust Christ alone as my Savior. If you have questions in that, please feel free to see me afterwards. I'd be happy to share some truths with you about that. Father, we thank you for what we've heard here today from your word. May we be students of your book to understand about these weights and then the sin of unbelief that easily besets us, restricts us from following you. May we have a group of believers that will be the next cloud of witnesses someday if they'll just faithfully go through this Christian race. We'll thank you for what you're doing in each person's life. For those who are facing an obstacle right now, we ask for direction, guidance, the sense of your presence. And Lord, we do ask for deliverance when you're ready to lift off that obstacle. May they learn the lessons you have for them. We thank you for those who have come through obstacles as a testimony of their confidence in you. We thank you and praise you again for your goodness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.